Hey, Elliot. Yeah, bud. Do you know what farmers give their wives on Valentine's Day? Please don't answer that. Hogs and kisses. Oh. Uh, you know, hogs. You as know, in pigs. No, I, I heard you. I heard you. Did you get it? No, I didn't get it. Please explain it to me. Wait, no, don't. Is this a warm up? Is this, are we recording? Depends. You think the joke was good enough to keep? No. Well, tomato, tomato. Keeping it. Good God, we are recording, aren't we? Well, hello everyone. This is Elliot, and this very not funny man with me is Andy, and this is the Poor Pearls Almanac. We're a podcast. And we're podcasting. And you know who else knew lots about podcasts? The Lowland Mayans. That's who. Yeah, that's what I said about them, right? Absolutely. No, wait, we already talked about Chiapas. We did. Are we going back to Chiapas? Sort of. So we are going back to the Lowland Mayans. And there are a lot of different practices within the Mayan agriculture system that occupy uh, what we think of as Mayan agriculture. But today we're going to focus specifically on the milpa, specifically of the lacandon, because they still exist. So lacandon is a few hours inland from Chiapas. So this is right along the uh, Guatemalan border. But to get there, we're going to have to talk your favorite thing, history and climate change. Yay! So like 200,000 years ago during Wait, the- are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are we really going back 200,000 years? So it starts with this very eager squirrel trying to get a nut. And as the ice begins to crack around the nut- Wait, you're pulling my leg, right? That's the, be- that's the beginning of the ice age. I know that one. Well, yeah, we're talking about the ice age. All right, so- <laughs> All right, I'm screwing with you. Yes, it is. that's the beginning of the Ice Age. So let's actually just fast forward a little bit. We're talking tropical areas, but what people might not realize is that the tropics are kind of a fairly new phenomenon on, well, the Earth. The Lone Maya region was really transformed by humans when they showed up in the New World, which is a long conversation that we probably don't have time or the knowledge to get into. And when they showed up, they started influencing the landscape ecology basically from the earliest stages, managing and domesticating plants in a setting that changed from basically an arid temperate zone to a wet tropical one around 10 to 8,000 years ago. Okay, so what's that mean for the beginning of the story exactly? The point is that the forest that we see further north, you know, like where we live, pines and oaks and things like that in the northern United States, are basically what these regions in Central America looked like for like a really long time. Now, from about 8,000 to 4,000 years ago, the archaeological data that we have is really limited, but there is evidence of domesticated plants, which shows that the people living there were already basically manipulating the landscape. While there were things like maize and beans and squash and chilies, which supplemented hunting and gathering, there was a lot of examples of these people manipulating even the trees and things like that. During this period, much like we saw in other places, the climate was changing very quickly. Precipitation was increasing, the planet was warming, and during this time, the plant community started to change from that temperate, what we think of again, of like northern North America climate, to more of a tropical climate. And the pollen records that we have show at this point there was an extensive mature forest cover, which slowly changed from pines and oaks to the tropics that we know today, which took over. Okay, so I sort of see where you're setting this up in the vein of this podcast. So with changes in the climate and precipitation, these landscapes probably changed with or because of it, and the ways those landscapes were managed obviously had to change as well. Exactly. Unlike today, where the climate is stable and we don't have to worry about these types of massive changes, that was a joke, sorry, was not funny because we're all about to die. Even with that knowledge- what This we... is in a Doomer podcast. Not yet. I need to go get some whiskey and then it can definitely become a Doomer podcast. The the point is that the idea of the landscape changing while people existed on it isn't something new, but here we see it in a way that's a little bit different and maybe a little bit insightful for places like the southeastern United States, where they're dipping their toes at this point into a climate very similar to what evolved in the Maya. It's one of those things that it should give us a little bit of inspiration as humans, we're basically fire beavers and we just need to like burn a new path to make things better and claim the throne or some shit. 
So Mad Max isn't a post-apocalyptic warning, but simply a reminder that we're survivors and can deal with stuff pretty much when things change and get hard. I live. I die. I live again. So anyways, let's fast forward a little bit. When these early Maya settlements emerged from around 4,000 to 3,000 years ago, as we think of them today, the community really increasingly depended on horticulture and the expansion of some kind of agriculture while essentially living within the forest. The paleoecological record of the region shows that beginning around 4,000 years ago, precipitation became really unstable and unpredictable. And this basically created a period of climate chaos. This chaos created environmental stress that dramatically changed the landscape and ultimately ended up changing some of the the land management practices, as we'll see, where this idea of preparing for essentially ecological collapse became really ingrained in how they managed certain parts of the landscape, which is really interesting how that got passed down. So what we really see is alternating wet and dry cycles over like hundreds of years, which create these radical changes that both influenced the flora and fauna and resulted in a new way of life for the Mesoamericans. Again, ultimately, we don't have a lot of evidence of what this period really looked like outside of the climate. Although there were these chaotic extremes of high and low annual precipitation, the trend was really towards drier conditions that persisted to fairly recently. So does that mean they stabilized at some point, like right around now? Yeah, it's about around three to about 3,000 years ago, we'll say where we start to see these widespread, small, but permanent settlements start to show up. And even as early as about 2,500 years ago, they really start to dominate the region. It's around this time between 4,000 and 2,500 years ago that we start to see the rise of the milpa that we recognize today. Although this probably came from thousands of years of practices that coalesced around the new climate and ecology that arose basically around this point. All right. So what's this milpa look like? Well, we'll start with a little bit of a backdrop here. So to go back to that squirrel. Not again. (laughs) No? Nope. Fine. So the fundamental feature of the Maya forest is that it's in a really interesting space. The landscape goes from basically high cloud forests of the mountains of Chiapas and Guatemala in the south through those mountain ranges and ridges that descend into what are lowland lime plains of the Yucatan Peninsula going towards the Gulf of Mexico. Now, in terms of like precipitation, what we see is average rainfall varies from less than 20 inches in the northwest Yucatan Peninsula to nearly 160 inches in the far south, which is about a span of 600 miles. So that's a massive change. Yeah. So I got to imagine that creates some diversity with a whole lot of, you know, that edge space area that promotes that diversity by creating, you know, more niches and more spaces to do your thing. Basically. It's estimated that of this landscape, about 40% of it is wetlands, which is unsurprising, I guess, given the the amount of rain in the region. In terms of like seasons, the climate's really divided into like wet and dry season, but it's not that simple. Contemporary local farmers identify four different seasons, and that's the rainy winter season, which is usually considered the first season of the year. The warm wet period associated with hurricanes follows that. And then a cool wet period associated with the Nortes, which are basically cool winds, followed by the dry, quote unquote, summer. So there's like three summers and a weird winter. Okay, so the plants literally do that Mad Max thing where they're like, I live, I die, I live again. Yeah, kind of. You're making this shit up. I I am making this up. Are you really? I'm repeating what I read. So please, if this is incorrect, send your criticisms to Ronald Nye. The last I read, he was spending his golden years teaching science through gardening with the farmers in Chiapas. So, uh, clearly needs to be corrected from his academic tower. Yep. Send your inquiries straight to the Zapatistas. Yeah, maybe they'll send some of that Alex Jones Zapatista coffee back to us. Those is fair trade. This is fair trade. They're communists, but they're not really communists. They just live in a commune. But it's not a communist. It's just a commune. God, if you have not listened to that Alex Jones clip, you you need to. Hi, I'm Liz, here with Red, and we're Listen Left. We're really appreciative of Poor Pearl's realistic take on ongoing collapse. They give a reasonable voice to a subject where reasonable voices are hard to find. Listening empowers us to build a world without capitalism, and that's why we've been supporting our comrades' Patreon for over a year now. 
For our project, Listen Left, we found that many leftist texts, from Marxist Leninists to anarchists and beyond, are very hard to find as audiobooks, and certainly not for free. So we decided to make those audiobooks. Find us on Instagram, SoundCloud, or just listenleft.org for a ton of free accessible audiobooks. So while we're going to focus primarily on the MILPA, it's important to contextualize all of this. I thought we were already doing that. We're going to keep doing that. And I think I just really like to reiterate things because I just want to hear myself talk. Oh, we're aware. Well, you know what? Now, I don't want to. I guess we're done then. Okay, fine. So, unfortunately, the land stewardship techniques of the ancient Maya as a whole uh, was based on a bunch of different things. They used things like ridged fields, water control, intercropping schemes, and complex scheduling of activities, many of which have been lost to scientific inquiry. We only know a little bit at this point. And much of this specialized knowledge perished in the massive depopulation which followed the Spanish conquest of the Maya area, and only a few of those groups have continued to use elements of these practical environmental knowledge. Among these groups are the Lacandon, Maya, the folks we're primarily focusing on, which are a traditional farming, hunting, and collecting group of eastern Chiapas, Mexico. These folks practice a system of Swidden agroforestry that mimics the surrounding ecosystem and its successional stages. Their fields rotate through grasses, which is the milpa stage, shrubs, which is acajual, and the forest fallow stages, which regenerate the soil, nutrients, and the seed banks. In each successional stage, including the fallow stages, they are able to produce hundreds of crops, raw materials, and medicines. Okay, so this is like the Dayak, who also had a pretty similar ecological backdrop, but you had mentioned Swidden, so do you want to talk about that and remind people what that is again? Yeah, so the Swidden ag system that they had put together was incredibly similar, but what we see play out here is that on a different continent with different native plants... It becomes a little bit different, and they also take advantage of other resources, and we'll see some really fundamental differences come out. Now, much like the Dayak, the Milpas were focused around those well-drained zones that were basically at the bottom of the upland slopes, but also above the annual flood line. Okay, the idea here is to get the best topsoils that have been washed down the slopes while staying out of the dangerous flood zones, sort of like replenishing like a delta or riparian zone. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're staying a little bit further out than that riparian, or they're trying to at least, because riparian zones do flood a bit, uh, and those those plants are designed to handle a little bit of flooding. But, you know, just a little bit further upland, similar to what we've seen in basically most native agricultural systems in water-heavy areas, whether that was the Dayak or the Satayama. That's all you had to say, man. I get it now. Yeah, I guess. Let's talk about that milpa. The milpa, or the early successional stage, is basically a polyculture field, which is a bunch of different plants planted in one place. And it's primarily dominated by maize, which includes 20 to 30 additional plant species. Now, some of these species are planted, while others are allowed to regenerate from the soil seed bank, from the previously existing forest, and some are just the coppices from the stumps of the trees that were chopped down. Now, this milpa stage is farmed for up to about five years in continual production. After about five years, weeds become more prevalent and the farmer will allow the field to move into the next successional stage or the akawal. So almost exactly like the Dayak at this point, except maize instead of rice. Yeah, the Lacandon called the akawal basically the brush and early tree stage, Pak Chekhoi, which literally means tree milpa. This stage includes a range of even like 60 or so species of shrubs and bushes from which the Lacandon extract food and materials. The Akawal is managed for about seven years. After that, the Lacandon can cut, dry, and burn the Akawal, returning it to the Milpa or allow the Akawal to develop to the secondary forest stage. It's in this stage the Lacandon extract many products from the forest, including wood, fruit, fungi, and animals. Okay, so they grow the food and the good nutrients, and then they do the coppicing and polleting for non-food resources like building materials and firewood, as well as, you know, growing mushrooms and the animals that eat them and stuff. It's really important to understand the secondary stage to fully understand the complexity of the milpa itself, because what they're doing is giving plants that take multiple years before they produce an opportunity to grow side by side with these annuals. And it's a mutually beneficial opportunity. Now let's rewind back to that milpa just a little bit. So we talked about them clearing the land. But the firing process is kind of unique. 
when the Maya tribes have traditionally burned sites, they often employ specialists known as wind tenders who control milpa fires by burning against the prevailing winds and spreading the brush out to achieve basically an even low temperature burn throughout the process. This burning process at this low temperature basically allows for a heavy input of black carbon into the soil as well as some other good stuff that helps build that biomass. Because if we remember, rainforest soils are generally not very good. In Milpa, Sweden, the slashing is very similar to what we think of when we talk about coppicing and pollarding and pruning. What we don't see is the digging of the roots of all the trees that we did with the Dayak, for example. Okay. So in the Milpa, they're burning to clear the landscape, except the trees can survive because they're not digging up the roots and they, they shoot up quickly after all that nutrients has been released through the fire. I live, I die, I live again. Yes. It's like the phoenix or some shit. Yeah. So because of the annuals they grow, having these coppices and planting things that take multiple years and will grow beside them, offering some shade can really be helpful to those plants that they want to harvest. And it also helps reduce the weed pressure from the plants they don't want. And like I said later, those trees provide other services. Okay, so because of the trees that are already there, it's a better growing site than, say, something that's already like fully cleared but equally fertile? Yeah. That's pretty sweet. Definitely. Right? And by preserving the primary forest, which they don't really touch, as we've kind of talked about a little bit at this point, but we'll talk about more, they have a resource that provides a lot of biodiversity to drive the conversion of the fields between the stages. So, like... They essentially have this giant seed and tree bank that surrounds the milpa because they don't traditionally clear many, many of those older forests. In doing this, the diversity around the milpa works its way naturally through the field and uh, basically a gentle hand by the Maya people. And in doing this, there's been evidence that actually the forest recovery is accelerated under this traditional management system compared to like an uncontrolled natural, quote unquote, regeneration. So is it better to cut in those primary forests or within those successional stages? Well, the Lacandones prefer to cut the milpas in regrowth areas, those acawales. Historical accounts really show that this has been a preference for a long time and is basically a feature of that, their agricultural system. Although they've had access to basically unlimited, and I, I say unlimited very loosely here, primary forest until they were relocated in the 1970s. Most families still remained within those limited areas where they'd been cleared before. And even when they had to move, they looked for sites that were previously occupied by other Lacandones. In the Lacandone area, clearing like two and a half acres of regrowth with like an axe and machete requires like eight days of labor. Now, clearing that same amount of primary forest would require like 30 to 40 days. Okay, so I could see why doing it their way is a bit more attractive. Yeah, I mean, I, I would also rather work 30 or so days less a year, given the option. I don't know if I actually believe that. First off, podcasting isn't work. It's fun. I've watched you and me go gray over this year, so... It's like a mix of business and pleasure. Podcasts are like work mullets. Podcasts are work mullets. You heard it here. You know, like, we. it sounds like a party, but it's... No, wait. It's... How do mullets work? <laughs> Business in the front, party in the back. Yeah, that's what it sounds. That's what. That's exactly what a podcast is. I would say it's like a reverse mullet. Like it's a party in the front. It looks like we're having a lot of fun, but it's business in the back, which is like I don't know. The new haircut reminds me of Vikings. Like I don't know if you've watched it, but like Ragnar, the main character, his head's like shaved all around the sides, but then like the front is fully grown out. Like that's like a podcast. It's party in the front and business in the back. That's metal as shit, right? Bring that haircut back. Bring it back. <laughs> Bring it back. I want to see it. I think you should. Bring the dreads back. Okay. Do it. It'll be about 10 years. It'll take about 10 years, buddy. I got nowhere to be. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> you you got it. Come Coming right up. Yeah. And if you guys want to see Elliot grow out his dreads, go over to our Patreon and throw us a couple bucks and thank us for our reverse work mullets and maybe we can convince him to grow it out. I'll do it, I'll do it for free. You'll do it for free. <laughs> yeah. What a what a good man. Yeah. An honest soul. I'm I'm work I started working on it right now. So uh yeah. If you guys want to go check out our Patreon and I will plug it again. 
Come on, Andy. We have people who do ads for us to tell our listeners that. Well, the people who do our ads are us. So I'm going to tell past me to do present me's work. So present me is the capitalist and past me is the laborer. Keep Andy from creating an exploited labor class of the past. The past letariat. Working class pasta. Is that an Italian thing? I don't... Ooh, another Italian joke. Or like fo- followers of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Yes. Is the Flying Spaghetti Monster still a thing? I mean, it's as real as you want it to be, bud. I've ever told you about the time I actually had somebody come into my office and their license picture that I had to scan a copy of actually had the colander hat on? So, for our younger listeners, I guess I should probably clarify... The Flying Spaghetti Monster is... I'm sure they're familiar with the Flying Spaghetti Monster and Pastafarianism, and also, no, we're not going there. So yeah, he showed me his proof of ID, and it had the colander on his head, and that's like etched into my brain now. Sorry, that's not really a great story so much as like a moment. Yeah, you might want to keep that as a one-liner, bud. Yeah, anyways, uh, what were we talking about? Clearing a milpa with fire like fire beavers. Okay, so if the farmer does hate his back... And he does want to select a new milpa site in the primary forest. There's a couple different environmental and religious and topographical factors. So first, they want to find a flat, well-drained area that has basically fewer, no large stones for obvious reasons. Second, he basically tries to figure out what the type of soil is there. Now, in this region, there's like a bunch of different types of soil and only a few are considered really arable. It's basically assumed that red and black soils are the best And that's because red indicates higher drylands and the black will be high in organic matter. So honestly, the sites are probably former Milpa sites from like dozens of generations ago. And further, like I said, there is a spiritual component that takes place with agriculture. So for the Maya, their understanding of spirits is really tied to an understanding of morality. Bad intentions, egotistical attitudes, or basically any type of lack of respect for nature can lead to negative consequences for not just the person, but their entire community. So it's not only the actions directly related to agriculture, where someone has to be really careful. All aspects of behavior basically require respect for other humans and the nature spirits. So it's kind of like an interesting checking system for people to stay in alignment with the needs of the community. The success in agriculture is really dependent not only on the material and ecological factors, but also the harmony that these farmers have with their communities and their ability to establish relationships with the spiritual beings that animate nature. Now, this idea is really fundamental to traditional Maya agriculture, even today. That makes sense. They had values that warned themselves from being greedy or overreaching without contemplating the long-term effects of changes they you know, want to make, whether they do it impulsively or selfishly or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, there were uh, a bunch of different tools that they used to keep people in check from the religious component to the natural and ultimately the coercion of staying with the community for the long term sustainability of the community. Okay, so protect the resource first before you overextend your extraction. Exactly. So in preparing this new site, The farmer would traditionally mark out the four cardinal directions and the center where he stands and basically faces each direction as he prays and makes offerings to the milpa in harmony with cosmic forces. The philosophy expressed here is one of partnership and reciprocity with the land and the spirits in basically every natural process. The idea really is co-responsibility, not control over nature, similar to the reciprocity that governs social relations in the Maya community. The living spiritual being that animates the maze is known in Maya as the soul or heart of maze. The actions and the virtues of the farm family and community motivate the soul of maze to stay with them. If they waste maize or otherwise offend the soul, it will complain to the earth lord and possibly abandon the family or even worse, the entire community. If the soul of maize leaves, one's maize supply and even the seed might be lost. I did read the notes that equivalent exchange is the first rule of alchemy and milpas, so I get it. Yeah, this view pertains to what is called the common tradition. The idea that humans are sinners and misfortune results from the normal will of the gods to punish. Most Mesoamericans have believed this since basically prehistoric times, or that's what our records show. Now, other ceremonies involve acts to purify one's sins to basically lessen the punishment. 
Now, we won't dive in any deeper, but I think it's important to highlight this relationship in the land management process because it underlies all of the decisions that they make. Now, in initiating the MILPA cycle, we see what's called petition and thanksgiving. So, farmers might make offerings of prayer and food before cutting the vegetation, again once it's burned, again before planting, and again also when the corn is mature. These ceremonial prayers last three days and name the specific features to protect in the particular milpa. For example, the rocky spots where they may struggle to grow, low areas for flooding, discrete trees that are important, specific birds that pollinate, and so on. A lot of prayers. And it sounds like there was a, do you talk about a naming ceremony? Like were they eating the psychedelic mushrooms then? I mean, they might have been. They did harvest a lot of mushrooms. I'm not super familiar with what native psychedelics might be in that that area. But I, I wouldn't say it's out of the scope considering some of the other traditional practices in this region. So once all of this is complete, the farmer basically clears the plant growth on that selected milpa site, whether again, primary forest or regrowth during January, February or March. And this allows the cuttings to dry until about mid April or so when they burn the area for planting. Before setting fire to the milpa, the farmer cuts fire breaks around the entire site. An additional fire break is provided by the ring of those primary forest trees that's left standing on all edges of the milpa. So as we know, they're not touching much of the primary forest. So you've got these massive trees basically circling the milpa itself. And on top of all the stuff that's been cut, that's too big to be burned in these very low temperature fires. You also have these massive trees which operate both as a fire break and also to um, create a more moist and less combustible area on all of the surrounding sides. These primary forests also provide a source of seed for that future forest regeneration, like we said, and also serve as a windbreak and barrier to stop the spread of things like insects, pests, and crop diseases. And we've talked about this before, getting multi-use out of your resources is the thing that makes all of this, you know, so genius and like that ancestral knowledge where it passed down, we know this works. And look, it also has this benefit too, because that primary forest is essential. It acts as a barrier to prevent the fire from spreading while keeping the surrounding area moist. And then also it's a seed bank in the future for when they want to clear new spaces for the new milpas, right? Yeah. Now, the fire is used again here as a cultivation tool between consecutive corn crops in the same milpa. So they'll grow things up and when the plant debris and the weeds that they pull out are collected, they'll eventually burn them or apply them as basically a, a dry soil amendment that they just drop right over the top. And it's in this process that when they burn it, that they can quickly recycle a lot of those unharvested nutrients for basically to extend for those five years. So is this similar to the biochar you always talk about? So it adds charcoal and ash, but there's other material that's burned and utilized into biochar when we had talked about that chop and drop and when they initially cleared the site. So this is just ashes? Char. Not the fish. I think people know it's not the fish. You say that. We got a big fishing audience. In context. We got to stay in context here. So we should just like turn char into char. Char. Charred bones. Oh, here we go. Char squared? Nope. The old Charlie Char. We have to do this every episode, and I, I don't like it. We're in uncharted territory. I'm going to see how long you can go. Go for it. Go. Getting all charged up. char <laughs> I can't anymore. Please, please stop. <laughs> please stop. <laughs> I think my all ears right, are fine. bleeding. Good. Anyways, after burning the Milpa plot and creating some of that char... The farmer may wait a month or more before actually planting the area in corn. During this interim period, they can prevent soil erosion and nutrient leaching by planting things like fast-growing root and tree crops and allowing those coppice trees to come back. And things like taro, coyote, papaya, and bananas and plantains are often planted in these sites. Now, when the rains begin in May or June, that's when they decide to start planting the corn and squash using the koa or the dibble stick, as Elliot fondly remembers from the Dayak. Yeah, I know how to dibble. I can dibble with the best of them. There you go. So the Lacandon farmers recognize up to six cultivars of corn, white, yellow, rojo, short, and black. That's five. I don't know where the sixth one is. But all of these serve different cultural uses and functions. 
uh, white corn is the most common. It's really hard and rot resistant, which allows for long term storage when dried, but also requires to be boiled along with things like alkaline substances so that it can be consumed. This process, known as nixtamalization, is typically performed using things like lime or wood ash or snail shells. Okay, so I could see how somebody would accidentally make popcorn trying to do this process. You just mix, mix the bags up and you use the seeds instead of the, the corn and oops, look, look at this. <laughs> I accidentally made popcorn. Popcorn, snail flavored. Orville Redenbach is a goddamn liar. Orville Redden... I got nothing. I really want to make a snail joke there and I got nothing. Sorry, I failed. So anyone that's planted corn, you know that the germination rate or germination process takes about a week or so. And after about two weeks, the farmer will go back and plant in the areas where the corn hasn't sprouted. Together, these two corn seedlings will usually take about 80 man hours per about two and a half acres. That's not terrible, right? No, not at all. I'm not a farmer. It sounds awful. Hey, thanks for listening. You know, one of the weird things about podcasts is that we don't ever get to interact with any of y'all listening right now. So to make up for it, we're going to do something special. Yeah, we are. Oh shit, I didn't know you were here. Me either. Is there anyone else here? Okay, so on 420, 9 p.m. EST, Eastern Standard Time, we're going to be live talking about what, Nash? The history of... Wait for it. Cannabis. Get on the bus. The cannabis. Get it? Get it? You know what? Never mind. We'll be live on our Twitch channel, our YouTube channel, and our Facebook page for some reason, and even our Twitter handle. You'll be able to comment along with us as we discuss the topic du jour. What? It's gonna be great. I'm gonna be the... I'm Matt... You have to tune in April 20th, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, Twitter even. It's free, so if you're enjoying us, why not? The History of Cannabis. For our socials and the links for the event, jump on poorproles.com. Like I said earlier, there's up to 60 different species that might be planted after these corn seedlings are done during the rainy season, which is through basically October. Planting times for several of those crops are signaled by the flowering of certain primary forest indicator species. So now this primary forest is not only protecting the landscape, but also indicating to the milpa when things need to be planted. The period during which these plants flower is termed the foot, quote unquote, of the crop, and the lacandon take care to plant during these, quote unquote, foot periods. Now this system coordinates the agricultural cycle with basically the current environmental conditions, rather than like a fixed calendar that makes really no provisions for the annual variations and things like temperature and precipitation. Right. And this is the part that I, I sound like a broken record, but this is that knowledge that's being passed down where they know all of this stuff works. They don't need a calendar or a clock or anything for it. You just sort of know when to move on to the next period because you're paying attention to what's going on and what's important to the things that you need to live, right? Yeah, it's a really clear difference between like the linear thinking that we traditionally put where it's like, all right, what's the last frost date? And instead thinking about the relationships between things instead of the linearity of time, essentially. Yeah, that's very true. Because in an era of climate change, calendars are basically useless. Typically, the past couple of years, I've cleaned up my leaves and done my thing with my leaves to clean my garden and use what I can, throw them in a bucket of water or whatever the hell Andy said. <laughs> but yeah, this year I didn't finish cleaning all my leaves up until the week before Christmas because they didn't fall until then. It took almost two months, not two months, maybe six weeks past the last leaf fall for the leaves to fall. So my calendar's drunk now. Is that why you keep asking what year it is? Yeah, I guess I keep asking what season is it because <gasps> every, th every, 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 every three weeks, it's a different season around here. Yeah. So now in these milpa, we've got these primary species planted. And besides the corn and the squash, we see like tobacco and beans and watermelon and sweet potato and peanuts and rice and sugar cane and onions and garlic and yams and tomatoes and cotton. And that's just to name the ones that are easy to recognize or common that we would recognize as probably our listenership. 
Yeah, so that tropical climate allowed for these to be the primary species. These things are really diverse. And from what I can find, at least, I think they're significantly more diverse than the Dayak. And unlike the Dayak, instead of planting with the idea of creating walls of protection from grazing, the crops are actually planted throughout the milpa in a pattern that prevents large clusters of single species. So like corn is planted every five or so feet throughout the milpa, and all other crops are spaced between these hills of corn. Although the milpa may contain 20 bunches of onions or whatever it might be, none of these bunches are going to be situated like within 10 feet of another. And in this idea, they're basically emulating the diversity of the forest which surrounds it. And the milpa gradually becomes a living mass of food producing plants which occupy the entire cleared area, both above and below the soil. Yeah, so that sounds like something we could try like around here, maybe at your farm, but without the peanuts and sugarcane. Yeah, I think we could probably like substitute sunflowers for sugarcane and basically do the same thing. Picking tobacco and cotton. I can see it now. Listen, don't put your reading in on me. Yeah, I've read into it, Andy. I'm not doing it. Not even for like a shiny nickel? Hey, at least I'm getting paid. Progress. Hashtag build back better or something. I don't know. Oh, I did, my stomach just turned. <laughs> my stomach literally just flipped upside down when you said that. It hurt me too. Don't worry. So the ground between these hills of corn, to get back to what we were talking about, is covered with those squash and the vines and the leaves of sweet potatoes and yams and ikamas. Standing above this surface growth are maturing trees of the papayas and the bananas and the plantains and varieties of wild plant species. Finally, what I think is the coolest thing is these root crop systems where they have them lying varying depths below the surface. You have taro and sweet potatoes just a few inches beneath the soil maniac below them and yam tubers below the maniac. In this way, crops utilize available space, water, and soil nutrients in a highly efficient manner. They have multiple layers of tubers. They layer them. And we're, we're talking like they're pretty close together. Yeah, it's literally stacked tubers over one another. That's nuts. Yeah, it's, wait for it, ground nuts. I, this is my fault. I set you up for it. Yeah, you did. This is all your fault. I'm just going to ignore you. That's cold. Yeah, I'm going to ignore it. That's char cold, all right? <laughs> all right, you might have got me a little bit. It reminds me of the three sisters method like that we talk about around here often, but it's like the 30 sisters or something, and like three of the sisters skipped town one day and like buried their stuff before they left with the tubers. I uh, I think I got lost in that metaphor. Yeah, sorry about that. It just reminds me of the three sisters method. I'm just going to stay there. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's interesting. You know, we had talked about at the beginning of this episode, and I think it's really critical to understand in this bigger conversation that the temperate climate had once existed in this region before. So that raises the question of which came first, whether it's the three sisters or this and I'm not sure if one necessarily came first. I think there's probably a divergence as people moved up going north with the climate and other people stayed back essentially and evolved with a new climate, which I think is really important when we start talking about this concept of how do we go back to the land and honor the traditional practices of the landscape while acknowledging that the landscape has changed because that's what we've done historically and that's what we've talked about even in this episode and basically every episode where we've talked about massive climactic change where people have existed. So I don't think one necessarily came before the other. I think they both evolved from something else, if that makes sense. So that's like a really long way of saying you don't know. I'm sorry, Elliot. No, I don't know. I'm sorry too, Andy. I had higher hopes for you. I had higher hopes for this episode. And I think we've babbled ourselves into another two-parter because this is a lot to take in. Yeah. I think the point here is that the system is incredibly complex and nuanced and takes an extremely skilled person who spent probably their entire life learning to continue this practice, to balance the spacing and the needs of the plants with the landscape, while also working in a place that has these nutritional deficiencies and wild swings in water access. What a system like this does with this kind of diversity is really give you the diversity necessary to prepare you for whatever the weather patterns may look like. And in the second part of this, we're going to talk about how that became a really fundamental part of how they managed the landscape in preparing for the worst of those weather swings. But again, like Elliot said, I think we're 
we're probably done here because of the fact that we're closing in on like an hour and we still have a lot to cover. We've barely touched the surface on this. I have more questions. Like I have a question for you, right? Yeah. So you know what it takes to manage the landscape, right? It's a lot of time. You could say that. Do you have enough time to also be a weather shaman and like a wind whisperer, like a professional pyro technician and like burn stuff and farm and also like pray? You don't have enough time for that. This shit takes a village, bro. Yeah, it does. And that, you know, much like we talked about the Dayak, the bigger projects, the things like burning a milpa and clearing a milpa and harvesting the corn were traditionally done as a community. It wasn't an individual. So instead of being out on your own piece of land that you're responsible for, all of the farmers would join you and you guys would rotate to each other's land. And in that way, you're not only sharing the experience with people as opposed to like this utterly like homesteady, individualistic concept, but also you're able to cross pollinate knowledge and see different sites and learn, which is particularly important for younger people before they had their own sites where they could learn these things and pick up. You're not just learning on one two and a half acre site that happens to be where you help or whatever it might be. Because if you think about it, a two and a half acre site is going to provide you with like more than one person's food content. You're going to feed an entire family. So that meant sons would be helping on those pieces of land. And they would also be helping other people manage their land and see those different sites and learn those practices. So you made the end of the episode too long. Yeah, I know. I always do that. Every episode's too long. I'm like, there's no way we're going to go over 30 minutes and then it's an hour. I will be your weather shaman is what I was trying to segue into. Oh, okay. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I am just the worst. I will stop talking. Elliot, close us out. So we're going to finish this up. Andy's pretty long-winded. He's got a whole nother episode lined up to finish up the Milpas just to put the picture together. He got really excited on the layered tubers part, though. You should have seen his face light up when he was like, they layered tubers. And it it, it really is brilliant. But uh, yeah, we'll talk about it in the next episode. So thanks for listening. We kind of babbled on a little bit, but we'll 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 wrap it up in the next episode. Hell yeah. Don't you wish your tubers were dropped like me into the ground at different layers? Yeah, Andy drops ground nuts. Dropping them ground nuts. Oh, that's awful. You love it. Those deep, deep rooted ground nuts. Bye. We're done. <laughs> End this episode, please. No. End it. Never. End it. <laughs>